Prior to the dawn of democracy, there were very few opportunities for people living in townships to access quality, private health care at affordable rates. It was difficult then to get into private practice because most private hospitals <laughs> only admitted white patients. You know those days of apartheid days, patients were allowed in the private hospital but I was not allowed to go and see the patients there. At one stage I was the only black specialist in this country in private practice. I was a pioneer going to white hospitals. I could see the reverse. I, yeah, that black doctor is here again. Skilled black medical staff were employed at government and private hospitals far away from where they lived. And the community who required private healthcare services had to travel long distances to hospitals located in formerly white areas, often at considerable expense. In the late 1960s, a group of visionary businessmen, including Dr. G. M. Piche and Mr. Richard Maponya, under the leadership of Dr. N. Motlana, formed a company whose purpose was to establish a medical scheme and private clinic to serve the disadvantaged communities. In 1985, the group opened its first private hospital, Lesedi Clinic, now renamed Dr. S. K. Matzeke Memorial Hospital, finally realizing their vision of bringing private quality health care to township areas. That led to the formation of the Clinics Health Group in 1992. It was the futuristic ambition of Dr. Peter Matzeke that saw the current and continuing growth of Clinics Health Group to greater heights. Clinics also facilitated the advancement of previously disadvantaged doctors by enabling them to open their own specialist practices in these underserviced communities. Thirty years later, Clinics continues the legacy by being a respected healthcare group consisting of six private, state-of-the-art hospitals located in Soweto, Johannesburg, Fosloras, Frenigen and Mafikeng. Together these hospitals have over 1,500 beds and 23 operating theatres. Facilities include ICU beds, 24-hour emergency units, renal dialysis, mental wellness services and 24-hour urgent care. Clinics continues to attract top healthcare professionals, which enables us to meet our mandate of providing a high standard of healthcare products and services, quality patient care and friendly service. Clinix is committed to providing economic opportunities by ensuring that procurement is outsourced to local businesses, supporting entrepreneurs and ensuring a bright future for all. We continue to be administered by a team of diverse and highly skilled medical practitioners who, being rooted in the community, know just what you need to thrive. Clinix Health Group. You are family. Indeed, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We also want to welcome you to our family, Clinics Health Group, once more this evening as we continue uh, bringing to you uh, top class information on medical in, uh, education and clinical practice. And it's one of those evenings as we gather together uh, from our respective uh, homes, uh, place of employment, wherever you are, we just want to say welcome to uh, clinics, health groups, uh, weekly webinars. And uh, we just want to, at the outset, just want to apologize that last week we were not able to host another webinar uh, due to the fact that one of our uh, speakers, uh, Professor Ashwini Shifulao, could not make it uh, due to unforeseen oh. circumstances. But we are glad to let you know that he will be back on the 4th of August 2022. So we have not uh, cancelled that uh, talk completely, but he will definitely be back with us on the 4th of August 2022, the first week of, uh, of, of August. And so this evening, as we continue with our webinars, we just want to indicate that uh, these uh, webinars are CPD accredited and we are live on YouTube. And so we also wish to welcome those who are on YouTube. And as usual, we request that you submit your details, your registration details when you register for, for, for these webinars, so that at the end of the presentations, uh, we can then uh, send the, your, your information to the appropriate uh, health regulator 
I know that the majority of you are registered with the HPCSA. Uh, those with the HPCSA know that we you don't have to uh, send your information uh, to them. Uh, we'll send it on your behalf and you'll get your CPD points uh, the following day. Uh, that information will be communicated to you uh, by the HPCSA. And also we request that you mute yourselves as when you uh, log in and also switch off your video so that we enhance the reception that we'll be uh, getting. We know that you are in the midst of load shedding and uh, some of you are not able to join sometimes because of load shedding uh, situation, but we're clear that at least some of you are here this evening to hear one uh, another important talk, an exciting topic that will be uh, bringing uh, to you this evening. And it's quite a pleasure to welcome uh, this evening uh, uh, Africa's first uh, uh, urologist to use robotic surgery, Dr. Kabo Ija Nekemu Musimonoku Mahiking, who was so an adult. And so we're glad to have you, uh, Dr. Kabo Ijane, who's a urologist, uh, he also an MBCHP from the University of Cape Town, uh, qualified in 2000, and also uh, went on to study a urology. And he tells me that he was actually at uh, Steve Biko Academic uh, Hospital, where he trained as a registrar to become a consultant in urology, and also attached to the University of Pretoria. Uh, where he obtained his um, uh, fellowship in urology from the College of Medicine of South Africa under the College of, College of Urologists. And uh, in 2016, Dr. Ijande completed a short course in medical impairment rating uh, at the uh, Foundation for Professional Development. And then he went on to do a diploma in advanced laparoscopic in surgery in uh, urology at the University of Strasbourg uh, in France. They published a journal uh, titled uh, Spermatic Cord Liposarcoma and Prostate Adenocarcinoma, Adenocarcinoma, a synchronous association under the African Journal of Urologists. He also authored uh, a, 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 an article, Pathophysiology of Urinary Tract Obstruction under the South African Urology and Gynecology Review. And so tonight she'll be speaking to us about uh, robotic surgery and prostate cancer management. Uh, as we said that this whole month, we're looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in advancement of med uh, medicine using medical technology, latest in medical technology. So it's one of those evenings when we have one of those discussions uh, brought to you by Dr. Kabo Ijani. And thank you very much for accepting the invitation to be with us, uh, Doc. Uh, it's quite a, a, an honor that you are, you are with us, you know that you've given a talk of this nature, but more in detail about prostate cancer. Uh, but uh, we also want to hear about how you navigate this um, uh, disease uh, using robotic surgery. Thank you and welcome to Clinics Health Group's uh, weekly webinars. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bila. Um, I'm honored to have been invited. And I am pleased that I could find the time to come talk to colleagues about this topic. Uh, good, good evening, colleagues. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I have, uh, it is a very broad topic and today, I'm going to dedicate a lot of time uh, making this as very simple as it can be so that I don't leave anybody behind. Uh, so everyone can follow exactly how we got here. I will then, the other part of this talk, uh, spend a little bit on the nitty gritties of medicine itself. I'm going to steer clear from unnecessary detailed controversies. I can address that in question and answer sessions. Uh, feel free to ask uh, anything broadly, including regarding prostate cancer generally, which this topic is usually around. However, I have thought it uh, prudent to uh, just give a general guidance 
of uh, uh, robotics, where uh, they are and how they got to be here. Uh, and then we will go through this together as we go along. So the robotics is just part of broad laparoscopic minimum invasive surgery. And the emphasis is on the comfort of the surgeons and the interactions of humans and machines so that we can achieve excellent results and excellent outcomes for our patients or for the services that we are rendering. And like many things in this world, it's also borrowed from Greeks and centralized around the word and the science of ergonomics, which just means uh, how natural laws work, uh, or rather the comfort of doing that which you ought to be doing. Uh, and in surgery, ergonomics simply means applied science, concerned with designing and arranging things people use so that things and people interact in the most efficient and in a very safe way. So where we are using the machines, the machines must be augmenting our skills and rendering us more efficient in what we do, but still remaining very safe to uh, the individuals uh, that we offer the services to. And that's where ergonomics and laparoscopy come into play. So uh, without being presumptive, uh, laparoscopy is part of minimum interventions that we do medically to perform uh, different procedures and or surgeries, and has been around for a very long time. And this is just a, a conventional old theater of laparoscopy uh, with the, the monitors there, anesthetic equipment, the lights, and the operating table. And as it got advanced to try to make our work a lot easier in the space where we function, you now get the monitors coming from the ceilings that can drop down. You've got columns that can move around, a very open theater, laminated floors, anesthetic machine also connected so that at any point in time, we can use the space efficiently to uh, change the position when you rotate the patient from lying on their back to lying on their side to working uh, from their leg side or working from their head side, you can rotate within this same space without fixed position so that we achieve better results. Uh, I think we all know the benefit of that. Where robotics come into play, uh, as you can see here, we back to a little bit of moving cards again, but uh, I'll be first to say that now we have screens that are now floating from the ceilings, as you've seen with that advanced laparoscopy theater. Uh, we still at urology hospital and in many instances use that card uh, that is mobile. The robot is there. I will show you a slightly zoomed clearer picture of what this robot is. And it's got another component there, which is what we call the console. So what robotics are, it's doing laparoscopic work. But uh, instead of the surgical team uh, holding instruments in their own hands manually, and using those little sticks to perform endoscopic or rather minimum invasive surgery, we connect the patient to a machine and the sticks are attached to the machine. The views are shown on the card and from other screens that will be all over so that people don't have to be turning their heads to look behind. The operating surgeon will be seated on this little guard gate looking through that hole, I will show you a closer picture later. Uh, if you look closely down there, you see all different clutches and gadgets for energy supply, for moving the machine, for working your hands. So it is kind of like a, a simulator of an aeroplane, but except here you are performing surgery 
The image is protected there, projected there for people in the room to see. The surgeons is looking through that, which provide a 3D vision of what is being done. Uh, the Da Vinci uh, system was the first one to be launched. Uh, there are now other systems that are starting to come into place. We'll talk about that uh, a, a bit later. And this is one of the generations of what we have. Uh, they have since improved and from a very big broad machine that looked like one of those robots from Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, we now get into much leaner, but more efficient. So they've shared some weight and they are now a little bit more efficient. Those arms can rotate a lot wider. They can be used a lot closer to each other as compared to these broad ones, which limited us on how wide they can be, how they can rotate. They will be clutching and crossing easily as opposed to when you look at these newer generations. I must say that these newer generation are already available in some centers in South Africa and can do a lot more with uh, much ease as compared to the older generations. So this just take you through the very early journeys. Robotics as the Da Vinci robot as an operating machine has been around the world since uh, the early 2000s. I think the first operations was launched around 2002. It only became available in South Africa around 2013, 2014. Uh, the urology hospital was the first one to acquire the robot at that point. We acquired uh, the SI version, which is that broad one I was showing you. This was the original ones, which has now almost been decommissioned, but there was rapid movement within a year or so to this technology. And some other big uh, centers in the country did acquire uh, this technology. I must say that now, of recent, the University of Cape Town in partnership, I think with Netcare and the University of Stellenbosch, I'm not sure who they partnered with, have been able to acquire services of the robots that uh, have been placed in their respective institution uh, to, to, to can be used. So you, you, you can get access to uh, laparoscopic robotic work also within the state. We have also now further moved up to single port, small linear robotics of that magnitude, as you can see the progression from that to this. So indicating very well that uh, uh, robotics are here to stay. They will not be going anywhere, uh, despite all the challenges, as we will come to discuss a bit later. So how do we do this? This is just a schematic picture to show an individual lying down, positioned with head away, the anesthetic machine will be that side. The legs are open a little bit. The robotic machine is standing there. And then we connect it like this and then we can perform surgeries in the pelvis. Uh, in urology, it will be largely prostate surgery. Uh, bladder surgery can be done also. The limitations are fundus. Uh, I will discuss that point a little bit later. Gynecologically, uh, internationally, hysterectomies, uh, abdominal pelvic resection for uh, colon rectal operations can also be done. I know there was a, a pilot project uh, with one of the big hospital groups where general surgeons were testing these technologies. I'm not privy to what was the outcome, but uh, up until Kroteski and Stellenbosch acquired the robot, it, it has been, funding has been the biggest limiting factor on what it can be used for uh, as opposed to uh, the skills. And this is just another schematic representation which showing you the arms of the robot, uh, how they will be and the patient will be positioned uh, in, in, in that uh, fashion. What is also of very interest is collaborative work or co-surgery. And uh, this is where we use multiple consoles, as you can see, there are two surgeons looking into two little different consoles, pictures projected there, the scrub or a theater technician, the patient connected, anesthetist will be sitting up there. 
And this provides uh, teaching, mentoring, co-surgeons, and where technology allows. And we're hoping that with 5G becoming more ubiquitous, uh, there will be an opportunity for this surgery to can even be performed remotely. Therefore, I could be sitting here in Pretoria at the urology hospital and cooperating or supervising somebody sitting in Swaziland on the robotic and they'll be sitting through the seeing what I'm seeing. The, the challenge of us doing that is the real life command if we have slow technologies. Because when I execute a command, it should be real time movement at the patient wherever they are. If there are delays, I am kind of like doing something and it happened two, three minutes later. And by the time I see what is happening, a lot could have happened. I could be having a bleed up. You could have damaged an organ. So unfortunately, that's been the limiting factor. It is possible already in other centers with um, a cable connections in the developed world for the surgeon to be performing this operation in another theater or on another floor while the patient is positioned somewhere, supervising and training a core surgeon. So the advantages of this are limitless and it can only be the future. So this is one great advantage where we will be able to move uh, the expertise to all corners of uh, uh, the continent, the country, uh, finances, and availability of expertise, of course, uh, allowing that. Uh, back to what we use the robot for, and as you can see with our topic, we'll be confining ourselves to uh, prostate surgery. But like I've mentioned, I will use this moment to mention that uh, it has been used for nephrectomies, it has been used for cystectomies, uh, there were pilot studies to have it used for uh, AP resections for rectal and other uh, pelvic work by general surgeons. So the colorectal surgeons, the gynecologists, the urologists, all of those people that are competing for the pelvis, we are able to use that. But then you can also use it for things like uh, 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 pelvic ureteric obstructions. You can use it for almost everything. The challenge here is the finances, the maintenance, and the cost and the benefit of what we can do for that. We are all hopeful and excited that with the uh, public-private partnership as has been done in the Western Cape and hopefully how they will follow suit, uh, more and more cases will be done and the funders can start realizing that there are increasing benefits of using this type and moving to this type of technologies. Of importance also is that uh, there are competitors now that are launching their own robots and the monopoly is starting to whittle down. The Da Vinci system has been the only one for almost two decades plus, but we know now that Medtronic is about to launch their own robot, which is already available in Europe. We were hoping for a launch later this year in the country, but uh, word in the ether is that it might be delayed. But uh, if you look at the price references of the expected Medtronic robot compared to the Da Vinci one, you can realize that the future looks a little bit reassuring in acquiring this technology and using it in a more generalized way. Uh, we do have uh, qualified trainers available in the countries. So uh, with time, we'll probably also do all the training that is required here and we won't have to send people to centers in Europe and et cetera, and et cetera. The uses here is that like all laparoscopic surgery, you need to have the patient who can have uh, an operation, who is fit to can undergo a procedure and does not have the contraindications. The disease must also be operable. It, it, it really does not help just because this is a robot to try to do a, a, an inoperable cancer uh, for the sake that you think the robot is going to assist because the robot is controlled by the operating surgeon and does not work autonomously. We are still very far from a point where 
uh, we will have autonomous robot operating, but probably to be the future. I wonder how many in the audience here will find out later will love to just uh, lie there, be connected to a robot that carries the operation without anybody involved. Uh, we are flying with uh, uh, automated uh, uh, autopilots. However, we are comfortable that there is still some trained pilots sitting somewhere there in the cockpit. And if we're told that uh, get into this flight, it's going to use GPS, it's autopilot from takeoff to landing. I think many of us and within our generation, we might hold a different view. And I believe that we'll, we will have to cross that head before we can now allow ourselves to go under the knife where the machine is going to perform all the operations without somebody watching. But it's probably the future. And if you think of the human error, machine error and everything, machines have been shown time and time to slightly do better than us humans over time. So I guess with time, we will get there. Availability, uh, the robot is now becoming ubiquitous in the country. There was a point when it was only at urology hospital. It was then acquired by a, a net care at Waterfall, but soon after that, MediClinic acquired other robots. And since then, there's plus minus maybe six or even more uh, robots available. Unfortunately, in Gauteng as a province, there's only two robots. And there's a lot of them available in the Western Cape to attach to the public sector via Grotesky Hospital and also via Stellenbosch, uh, the, the University of Stellenbosch. And uh, I think it presents a challenge if there is anybody who's involved with the Gauteng Department of Health available in the audience to can look at that and see that uh, if they manage to get it, it's possible that one could be brought to either Steve Biko, Barakwanath, George Mukari, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe even Bloomfontein like universities and then other institutions that could take over because it shouldn't be uh, at the seclusions of uh, some institutions and not be readily available. Acquiring the robot still remained a very expensive exercise. I, I think uh, when the urology hospital acquired it, it was in the regions of uh, plus minus uh, 25 to 30 million. Uh, uh, the prices have since come down. And what the companies were doing, they were moving very fast in uh, decommissioning older machines and then bringing the new one. And you have to trade in your older one to buy the new one because Otherwise, they wouldn't be supporting you with uh, uh, parts, uh, components, et cetera. Uh, with the competition coming into the market, that will become a thing of the past. Uh, so uh, the next challenge is with uh, uh, medical aids. Uh, I'll get to uh, the medical aids at the later stage. With prostate cancer, uh, the cancer that would be operated uh, via a a robotic uh, machine or robotic assisted laparoscopic uh, surgery is uh, the cancer that qualifies for open surgery anyway. So we restratify cancer into uh, uh, low risk, intermediate and high risk, and of course, localized versus metastasis, including locally advanced. Now, any localized or locally advanced cancer, which is amenable surgery, provided the patient is also operable, can be done uh, as much as uh, open or normal conventional laparoscopy. It can also be done via robotic. Robotic surgery has also been used for salvage treatment, in particular patients whose cancers were treated with uh, brachytherapy, a form of uh, uh, low dose uh, radiation over a period of time. And uh, some of those patients will have recurrence, local recurrence, and we have uh, successfully also performed robotic surgeries in those patients. So it does not mean that uh, an, a, a very advanced disease with uh, uh, bladder wall involvement, pelvic wall involvement, will all of a sudden benefit immensely from the robot because it's a robot. You still have to restratify the patients for that. The greater benefit of minimum invasive surgery, in particular for prostate cancer, is that this is minimum invasive surgery. Uh, it is generally a held truth that complex advanced disease still need to be operated in complex advanced way 
with the minimum trauma and with utmost preservations of organs that should be preserved. And that's where minimum surgery is available and, and it's useful. So we, we are able using robots, uh, we are able to perform very complex surgeries with the minimum collateral damage to the body. Uh, we are able to have enhanced maneuvers, reach very difficult to reach areas with very steady hands. As you can see, the surgeon is seated, the hands are supported on a little bar. So even if you are somebody with a bit of tremors, which we all know we can have, the robot is built in to kind of like dampen those down. The vision is improved. When you are looking through that console, you are seeing a three-dimensional view. So, and you are able to magnify life and uh, zoom out, zoom in while you are performing the surgery and you are very steady and seated without that. Uh, you don't tire easily as a surgeon. Uh, there is precise tissue handling. So there is less crushing injury to the tissue and we are able to maneuver that. The greatest benefit, minimum blood loss. If you think of prostate surgery, we used to be performing this with blood in theater on standby, either grouped and held or brought to theater, a cell saver and all that. And you will still transfuse patients even a couple of days. I must say that it's very rare in my own hands. After about uh, 71 cases, there was only one case that had to receive transfusions, which had uh, unfortunately very severe inflammation, a large prostate, but the rest of the patients, no transfusions at all, no blood on standby and no cell saver in theater. Those are all added costs, especially with blood being a rare commodity as we've come to know in South Africa. It's an added cost and it's something that can be used uh, in other areas where it's needed the most. There's no need for intensive care. Even the guy that uh, I had to transfuse was never admitted to high care. They go to the ward. We look after the patients in the ward. Of course, if somebody had other reasons for requiring intensive care unit, they will probably be taken there for that reason. But as a surgery, the gold standard of getting a high care ready, which we know uh, those who have all worked in the government institution, we will be all lined up to get an ICU bed to do a major surgery. And then a patient with trauma arrive, somebody who's in theater complicate, and we have to cancel and defer the operation because now we can go on further without that intensive care unit. If that could be removed as a minimum requirement for performing some of these major surgeries, uh, it will go a long way in assisting everyone else with the waiting list and also in preserving costs. Equally, the average stay of a patient who have had open radical prostatectomy would have been anything between seven days to two weeks. Now they live three to four days. So they are admitted on the day of surgery, they get operated, and majority in three days are gone. The remaining guys live in about the fourth day. Very few guys go past five days after this type of surgery. So if you look at all those other greater benefits, you realize that uh, this is something that we all should be looking at, working towards, be it public, private, or otherwise. I'm going to go a little bit here into comparing laparoscopy uh, versus robotics and say uh, the learning curve of robotics is much shorter than that of doing conventional laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the disadvantage is that it is not easily mobile. You, you need to be able to move all those guard gates that I have shown you. It is also very expensive to acquire, as I've mentioned, but it has already been proven in our own country that a uh, uh, public-private partnership make it possible to have it parked and available to the public for using. I have shown with those different videos of the migrating technology that uh, uh, this is an evolving technology from a very big, large machines to small little single hole machines as you have seen. So with that involvement and with other companies coming into play, 
we will probably be doing more robotics as opposed to conventional laparoscopic work. I, I do not for once hold an opinion that uh, conventional laparoscopic work will be lost as uh, it's easy to move if I needed to relocate back to my hometown of Mafikeng and there's no robot there, but I can do laparoscopy. I just pack my bags and go and I'll do laparoscopy there. Uh, and you can move to all other areas. However, the difference is that the learning curve is a little bit stiff. It's not easy to do that. And there are real benefits of doing laparoscopy. But where possible, we still also need to keep training people for laparoscopy. And of course, for open robotic prostatectomy, which is the ORP. Now, if you sit down and you compare both of them, laparoscopy versus robotics uh, versus uh, open uh, ro uh, radical prostatectomy. I've divided that into the intraoperative, which are the immediate uh, the, the differences, the uh, perioperative that is just immediately after the operations, the long-term and of importance, the oncological outcomes. Now I have, dwelt a lot into what are the benefits of the robotic. You, 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 robotics and laparoscopy together, they are minimum invasive surgery. Robotics provide you better ergonomics as I've started earlier. It provides you with three dimension pictures, the steadiness of your hands, the ability to magnify the pictures. Laparoscopy does also have 3D uh, systems which we do have at the urology hospitals and of course many other centers in the country do have 3D. You still have to control the instruments with your own hands and the movement of your shoulders, your wrists and everything. If the operation takes a little bit longer, it's easy for you to get fatigued. Uh, with robotics, you could be operating and going even for long. The longest operation I did for a, a robotic prostatectomy took me five and a half hours. And only after the histology came back, I realized that there was a three by two active abscess in the prostate, which was not there about three weeks earlier when we did an MRI. But because of the inflammations, the difficulties maneuvering that, we still managed to remove that prostate intact, didn't spill up any pus, and it was only discovered when the histology came back the patient still left the hospital three days later. There was no post-operative sepsis, no contaminations. And if that was laparoscopy, after a while, I probably would have been exhausted. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily with open, but the risk of uh, the pressure, the pulling, and the lack of precision that come with the open, one might have ruptured that. Of course, that is one case and an anecdotal experience. And I'm not for one saying all cases will be like that. But that's where ergonomics come into play, where it enhances our ability as surgeons. Uh, minimum blood loss, as I have indicated, and of course, quick recovery out of the hospital. While we are at that, before carrying on further down, I must say, after qualifying as a robotic surgeon, how I perform open radical prostatectomies have changed and they have improved. And I have seen over and over where I have to do open prostatic uh, uh, surgery that I'm doing it a little bit better. Uh, you are able to see the anatomy better from the robotics. So you have this inbuilt knowledge of the areas that you used to struggle with because now you, you know where they are. So it does enhance that. And every time when one is comparing all this, the very important question mark is that, who is the operating surgeon? What have they done before? Is this a robotic open and a laparoscopic surgeon, three in one, or is it somebody who is just open and somebody who is just uh, robotics? So all those things are usually not confounded for to try to show uh, the superiority of one of the techniques over the other. So in the ultimate uh, period, the surgeon kind of like is the greatest determinant. If you are a horrible surgeon, you will still be uh, probably not as good also as a robotic or as a laparoscopy. So we, those are the factors that are not easy to measure. The perioperative, we have mentioned intensive care. 
Unfortunately, with open laparoscopy, most of the patients still require high care. Uh, with robotics, is very, very few. With open robotics, patients still largely do require that. Uh, one may ask, Doc, why, why can't you take chances and you send all those patients also that did open robotics? And if you look at the surgical stress as measured by things like uh, pain experience, uh, inflammatory markers like CRP and et cetera, you blood loss, need for transfusions, you realize that those remain very high risk patients. And most of colleagues and those who are in the know know that nowadays, uh, the lawyers are breathing heavily on our necks. And if you were to put somebody who you did open uh, uh, surgery in the ward and they complicate, you may have to answer a lot, why didn't you send them to ICU? The funders will say we would have paid. The family said if we, need, if we knew, we could have raised more money to pay. So we also in a transitions where some of the decisions that are taken, we do them such that in the event where things go wrong, we are protected and can not be fouled easily. So unfortunately, that also is a confounding factor. If you look at the long-term outcomes and based on prostate surgery, we will be looking at urinary incontinence. We know that in the golden past, and this has been sold, especially within the radiation cycles, that performing prostate surgery is barbaric disfigurement. And uh, we are just brutalizing individuals because they're going to have urinary incontinence. They will have erectile dysfunctions. Uh, our response to that, we usually say, uh, talk to the people who do the operations vis-a-vis -vis people like myself. When you look at the incontinence of urine, most of the robotic operations that we do, that I do, will be continent by three months and will be fairly largely continent using one pet a day as early as two weeks to six weeks. And majority by six months, they are continent of urine. And if urinary incontinence was the reason to dissuade any individual who otherwise would have benefited immensely from having surgery, this is one thing that you can kind of like reassure them. Erectile dysfunction is another difficult condition after a radical prostatectomy. Unfortunately, a decision of whether a nerve sparing operation will be done or not is influenced by the staging and the degree of the disease. It is also influenced by the age of the patient. The younger you are, the more likely it is that you may retain some form of uh, erections and the pre-operative erection status. So if you already had weak erections, they will be weaker. And if you had very good, fairly uh, acceptable erections, whatever that means, uh, you will still maintain some sort of that provided we did nerve sparing. And uh, in many instances, because of the three-dimensional views, the magnification, the steadiness of the hands, it is a lot easier to perform nerve sparing surgery using robotics as opposed to laparoscopy and or open radical prostatectomy. In experienced high volume surgeons or who performs a lot of open uh, radical prostatectomies, they can still do fairly a very good uh, nerve sparing operation, even if it is open surgery. However, you find that uh, the patient will return to some sort of uh, uh, erection functioning earlier if bilateral nerve sparing was done and if there was minimum handling and trauma to the neurovascular bundles. And that is easily achieved by robotics. Uh, when we come to the real reasons why we do surgery, which is cancer control, the outcome is the same. So the operation, whether it is done laparoscopic, robotic, or open, if it is done properly by a competent surgeon, the surgical outcome in as far as uh, cancer control is OK. Early on, when we come to studies comparing Positive margins, that is where the surgeon might have uh, 
went a little bit too close to the prostate capsule or where the cancer was extending outside the capsule of the prostate, which are not necessarily interchangeable things. But you find that with experience, the positive margins become less. Early on, be it open laparoscopic or robotics, while you are still on that learning curve, you may have a slightly higher positive surgical margins. And if you compare very competent laparoscopics and robotics, the, some of the meta-analysis, which is looking at many studies by different institutions and applying uh, relative comparisons, uh, the advantage is slightly towards robotics. Uh, with open, it also just depends on the surgeons, the high volume surgeons will still have fairly good negative margins as opposed to somebody who's uh, low volume surgeons. But the surgical outcomes has not been shown to be very superior. So if you go into guidelines, uh, international guidelines, uh, local guidelines, different countries, be it the United States, the European Union, the guidelines by NICE and everything, they were all given indications that uh, they cannot recommend any above. However, as a general rule, we recommend minimum invasive surgery where available as the gold standard. Underline where available. So you don't have to be trying to do minimum invasive surgery if you know that you're not good at it and you're good at open. Then in that instances, please do stick to open robotic prostatectomies because it will benefit your patients more. Until such time that you have harnessed the robotics and laparoscopic skills, and then there will be a greater benefit in those instances. Uh, the next slide is just to give an indication of what the future will be looking like. And that shows you that last robot, which I showed you when I was going through the evolution of the technology, where now you've got a single arm. Uh, this robot is already available in some countries in Europe, uh, and it will probably be available soon in the country, also in, in not so distant future, where instead of multiple ports of entry, we use one port of entry, and on that, there's a couple of arms which can divert, as you can see there, uh, the light source, the different operations, and that will be the bladder, that's the prostate, that's supposed to represent the urethra. It is just a schematic picture to show how it will be. So as you can realize, there's even more minimum trauma that is caused to the body and even uh, uh, better access to the areas because now you don't have to be worried about damaging collateral damage from bowel, other organs, because everything is kind of like coupled together uh, in, in, into that. And uh, uh, this is just a, 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 a proud moment uh, a couple of years back uh, uh, where uh, the urology hospital was just uh, uh, branding me for uh, having qualified as a robotic surgeon. Uh, and with that, I will probably start taking some questions, but I wanted to just, I'm going to come out of this and play you a little bit of the real video where I was performing a prostate surgery robotically. Uh, this was in November of 2021. So there'll be a bit of a pause of a moment when I'm sweeping from this screen to the other one. And I will just fast track it to highlight some issues and then open to take questions where we can discuss the other greater details, controversies or anything if there are. I, I must apologize if it sounded too basic and simplistic. I just wanted to take a walk through this technology, what it can and then the comparative stuffs uh, of what it, what it means. Uh, Kamu, just tell me if uh, you can see the video. Yes, Doc, we can see it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this right at the beginning. Uh, this is a, a youngish patient, about 47 years old, who unfortunately had a high PSA, but turned out to have a localized uh, prostate cancer. Uh, this is the operation that I performed in November of 2021. As you can see here, this is uh, the, we, I'm freeing the peritoneal attachment of the bladder uh, so that it's inside the abdomen. So the pods have already been placed in. There is one assistant who is also helping me. 
but what you are seeing there, it is the scissor on my right hand and the grasper on my left. The lower instrument there is from my assistant, but the robot does have a third arm. So you can also be doing that by yourself, except it's always good to involve the assistants. You can see the beautiful view, the precision which we, we open up this, and this whole video is not edited. It is as raw as it is, it is live. I have not even moved it fast. Uh, I, I just want to, to appreciate how it goes. And this took only one hour, 10 minutes from cutting here to finishing up and stopping with an extra 30 minutes for having placed the pots, removing them. And this operation was done in one hour, 40 minutes. The gentleman is totally continent of urine. Uh, when using Viagra Cialis, now he's got his erections and he remains cancer free uh, seven, eight months uh, after the, 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 the procedure has been done. And uh, I'm not gonna play the whole hour of this. I just want to keep highlighting some little areas where I'll show you. Here, you can see on the, la on the right side, this is what we call an accessory artery, an accessory pudendal artery, which is present in 25% of men and has been associated with better continence if it is preserved. Uh, it goes all the way up and it's very easy because you can see it very easily with the robotics. And this is when I was preserving that artery for this gentleman. And as you can see, we are now, we have reached the prostate. That's the prostate gland. Uh, this is uh, the little ligaments that attaches it to the pelvic bone. You can free them pre, uh, very precisely. That's the suction. The bladder is seated somewhere there. And those are the instruments. And you can see there's no hurry. I could choose to work a little bit faster, but you still finish this in one hour, 10 minutes. So there's no need to rush and be in a hurry, hurry, cause unnecessary uh, bleedings when you are performing these operations. Uh, this is when I'm opening up the bladder and freeing up the prostate from the bladder. The bladder will now become posterior and it will be here and that will be entering the bladder at the back to start to free it and lift it up to remove it when the lateral aspects uh, 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 of that. I could play this a little bit slower, but I need to allow time for questioning and one hour of a video could be a little bit long. We are applying clips from the assistant there and, and then freeing up the lateral pedicles of the bladder. Uh, we have moved to about the seminal vesicles and those are the vast differences. And we're trying to uh, lift that up so that we can get that prostate out nicely as we proceed. Uh, about 41 minutes. Okay, so here the bladder is now separated completely. These are the seminal vesicles. I've went down to dig them from out together with the vast differences. This area here is that prostate. On the lateral side, this is when you start to free up that fascia where the nerves are attached so that I can then push them downwards for precise nerve sparing. And then you're going to take all that sheet down because the nerves runs at the bottom around five o'clock and around seven o'clock. And you, you can see the precision with which you can do this operation, the calmness with which you do it, and the view which you can really appreciate with uh, uh, this surgery. Uh, just uh, showing that neurovascular bundle, you can see this little strang here is the nerve that is now nice and free. This is the suture material that we use to control the area that used to bleed a lot called the dorsal venous complex, which is right at 12 o'clock. Every urologist and guys who've assisted urologists know that that is one of our nightmares for performing prostate surgery. But here you control it with uh, uh, extreme diligence and precision. You can see all that sheet here is containing the nerves and you can see I'm kind of like in nucleating and lifting this prostate out of the neurovascular bundles uh, in a 47 year old uh, gentleman who still really want to become sexually active and unfortunately has been diagnosed with cancer. 
one will want to do that. And we're going to be starting to work towards the urethra, which is right on that area. So I'll also just uh, move this a little bit, uh, moved it a little bit too far. Okay. You can see here the neurovascular bundle that's supposed to be a major bleeder. It's well controlled with the switcher material. I can pull that. There's the other arm that I was telling you about. I'm holding this prostate, pulling it a little bit backward. The assistant has got the suction just there to assist me to make sure that it remains nice and clear. The two arms that I'm using, I'm able to control uh, the dorsal venous complex very precisely and free the urethra under direct vision. The sphincter, which is important for continence, will be right there. And you can see, instead of cutting into it or bending into it, I'm pushing it. And as you can notice, there's not much smoke coming out of there. So I'm using mostly cutting and occasionally, that's when I will use a little bit of cauterization. And you can see a nice preserved sphincter, the urethra, as you see now, it's going to open up very nicely. And you should be able to see the catheter. You can see the urethra as we are freeing it. And an experienced assistant is also very useful. Here you can see she's kind of like pushing away the nerves that we've already saved earlier, putting a suction there to protect them away so we don't cause a lot of strain on them. And then we can do a very nice nerve sparing. There's the catheter and the urethra is opening nicely. You can see that urethra very nice, uh, very enhanced. The nerve bundle is on the other side. We have freed them completely and the surgery is progressing very, very nice and very slow. Here, it's when now I've just uh, reconnecting the bladder back to the urethra and you will see the ease with which this is done. You are just seated and it's like a little PlayStation. You're not stressed. You're doing a very beautiful surgery and uh, you know that the patient is going to get very good result. They can show you the catheter coming nicely through the urethra. Here is the bladder, the posterior part of the bladder. You can see the pink inside of the bladder and you put those stitches very nicely and precisely. And just to kind of like move towards conclusion, you can see these are the final stitches of that anastomosis. The time that you are seeing there, one hour, six minutes, is a real unedited time of performing this operation. Uh, so it does show you the greater benefit and the precision with which we put those stitches. Here, you just close the bladder and it is precisely connected minimum trauma to the rest of the body. They are testing if that bladder is leaking. There is no any leaking at all. We can fill it up and then we will remove those little stitches. And right at the end, use that stitch to just also bring back the lateral aspects of the bladder to what we call the endopelvic fascia, which is the little bit of supportive tissue on the side, which help elevate the bladder, take a little bit strain from anastomosis and also minimize any leaking or anything. And right at the, towards the end, we use a little bit of suction just to clear up any other little clots and then take all that little bladder covering and omentum, put it back into the position where it used to be. There's our bowel and that is the suction that we use just to clear up everything else. And in about uh, one hour, 12 minutes, plus minus one hour, 13 minutes, Operation done, voila, dingo, done and tested. And with that, I would thank you for your wonderful attention. Open up the floor for the questions and uh, thank you very much uh, for, 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 for the attention again. Wow, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Uh, quite uh, an exciting uh, moment for us to see live. Uh, you you at work, and I like when you say that you 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 enjoy doing this. It's like a PlayStation, so you enjoying work and play at the same time, uh, which makes an, an ethical question right from the beginning. 
uh, by Dr. Mathalie Daba, who's also a member of our board and clinics health group. Uh, we just want to say thank you for attending this session, Dr. Daba. And the first question that we are, we are posing, uh, it's um, that she's asking, what are the ethical issues that you have dealt with in your experience in robotic surgery? Uh, to tell the truth, uh, we have to break them into, uh, firstly, what we tell our patients. So it can start with a simple thing, just because I'm doing robots now, I want to convince everyone that the robot is good for you, please come for the robot. So how I cancel the patients, and it's always easy in my hands because uh, I can do brachytherapy, open surgery, laparoscopy, robotics. So it's easier to then open up all the discussions for the patients. Uh, it's usually very difficult if you're selling something more than the others without necessarily aiding and assisting the patients with informed consent. So for yeah. me, informed consent means that I should be able to tell you what I can do my limitations and the real benefits of the proposed treatment and allow you to then make the decision for yourself. Uh, I, unfortunately, in many instances, you end up with patients saying, doctor, what will you do? And if you tell them, I would rather you discuss with family and you guys tell me what you'd rather do, they always look at you like, uh, the doctor doesn't want to help us through. But that's really what informed consent is about. Uh, the second one is when it's coming to finances where you know that if you performed this operation, the patient will stand, uh, will benefit more from the, uh, the assist or the, the, the availability of the technology, but then the finances are not available. And it's an important question because uh, medical aid or funders uh, have come up with the difficulties of what can be done and what cannot be done except for few where you may have a global fee agreement, they impose a certain co-payment ranging from 12,000 to 15,000 to 30,000. So now sure. you find that the patient is not able to can undergo this or they even want to take a loan. My duty is to reassure them that I will be able to give acceptable high quality results with open surgery without you having to go and take loans and go into debt. Then there are issues where once the procedures are done, the expectations are not met because early on people were told this is utmost superior surgery. You stand a better chance with your erection. You stand better what, 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 and then the patient can they still have erectile dysfunction. After now they've paid 30,000 for argument's sake, co-payment, because they believe the reason they are paying it is to have their erections preserved. And now they're still struggling with erectile dysfunctions. So the honesty of the doctor and the self-reflections, it's key when it's coming to counseling way beyond just prostate surgery. So generally speaking, those are the issues. And just because unfortunately, this rather very useful and enhanced technology it's not really available to the common person from the streets. It is still some sort of an elitist thing. You must have a good, inverted commas, medical aid, even if you have a medical aid. And we know only very few people have medical aid and even fewer people have good medical aid. So those are the issues. Mm. Yeah, quite interesting. And, and also linked to this ethical issue, it's about also, because you, you say the future is when there will be autopilot or auto, you know, you know, non, non-human mm -hmm. intervention with uh, robots just doing the surgery. Um, have you considered what the implications would be in terms of, uh, uh, I know that maybe at the stage the HPCSA is not uh, to discuss this matter, uh, but anticipating what you, are, what you think they might, if there are any issues that may arise from the regulator. Yes, uh, the issue is that who, who remain responsible? Because right now, if I'm counseling you for robotic surgery, I am doing the surgery. Now, if we're going to have a discussion that uh, we plug you on a machine, the machine carries on the operation, and then there is machine failure, there is damage to the tissue, machine freezes, 
my response time, am I allowed to be staying in theater watching this machine? I'm not necessarily the technician, I'm the surgeon, but the machine is not under my control. Is it the technician? Is it the company? Is it the hospital group? Is it Dr. Ijan who's responsible? That would be very interesting when it comes to that. Who is yeah. ultimately responsible for your care? Uh, when I was doing that advanced laparoscopic work in, in Strasbourg in France, they took us through uh, a artificial intelligence where they looked at uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Mm -hmm. And then after looking at it over a many steps, they defined that there's actually very limited steps, only seven important steps that need to be done, despite everyone saying whatever. And if you just get this one, two, two, two correct, that thing is done in about 30 to 45 minutes. And they showed that with all those, it is very easy for machines to can take over that. But for example, if we're doing a robot now and it fails, in my theater, the sets are available for me to unplug the robot and carry on with laparoscopic prostatectomy, or even open up the patient and complete the operation as an open surgery for your safety. Uh, the machine can fail, the machine can jam, and all those things, we, even if it's very reliable, at some point it can fail, and that's where the human factor will still be favored. So it will be very interesting if and when it gets to that point, how we're going to maneuver that, yeah, or around sure. that. Mm. Now, now we, we, as we, we, we all know that we've got challenges with ESCOM, and we, we, we get load shedding. Um, what do you do? I mean, I know that there's generator backup, but in terms of a, a elective surgery, I think some yes. some thinking is that you, you you don't do elective surgery when you're on load shading, and even if you have generator backup, what is the view now to say? Do you continue with with generator backup with normal elective surgery, or you only do uh, you you only reserve it for emergencies? No, no. Luckily now, because uh, we, we hope ESCOM does follow the schedules as indicated, you fail have an idea when are you supposed to be load shed. And I don't think it's fully legislated as, as now because now load shedding is our day to day as opposed to in the past, you wouldn't necessarily want to start a yet unstarted operation in the event where you are only working with one generator, especially if it's a long, complicated operation and you are dependent on the machine. How we working at the urology hospital, we have a backup generator, which is fully fleshed to run off the grid completely. And that generator has got another backup generator. Mm -hmm. So it's ESCOM, a backup generator, which is able to run the system completely. And if that fails, there's another generator and they're all checked service regularly so that we are able to carry on. All that included, there's also inbuilt a uh, uh, safety into all the anesthetists and everything. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the robot does not have its own inbuilt uh, uh, long lasting or uh, uh, batteries that could carry it on if you have to carry on longer. But like I said, if everything else fails, you can still carry on with uh, or on laparoscopy. You can then also carry on with opening. I'm not necessarily a legal, a legal fundi on this. And I, I don't know with the generation as they move more and more forward, it remains a very interesting uh, medical legal conundrum. What happens if power fail when we're in the middle of the op, backup will kick up. If backup of backup fail, then I'll probably just open a U up and then we will carry on and finish up with a little backup that we might have to finish up that operations. But now, do you then start the op if you know you are on stage six load shedding and you have the next four hours you are off the generator. And generally it might be safer to just defay it a little bit and do it at a time. Uh, solar remains another option where uh, hospitals now are investing on that. We at the urology hospital are just about to completely go off the grid with the solar generated uh, energy. Uh, the, all the panels have been implemented. We are at the final stages of testing. And uh, it is now topical in the news about Barra using 3 million on diesel for backup. Yeah. And of course, other hospital been load shed. So I think the landscape is going to be changing very rapidly about what are we doing with load shedding and hospitals? Sure. 
Now, looking still in the future, in terms of uh, training, especially surgical discipline training, uh, will this become part of the curriculum in terms of uh, training of, uh, well, I think, undergraduate to postgraduate students? Yes, I, I think it definitely will. Uh, I think I saw somewhere, I don't know if he was leaving or joining uh, Dr. Salukizana from UCT. I know uh, we know about each other, but we don't necessarily know each other because he's attached fully to an academic institution with a robot. And I, I would have loved to hear his comment if he's somewhere there listening to us I, 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 to open up this platform to all colleagues. Uh, Dr. Matabe also was around, but my general opinion is that uh, when you look at laparoscopy generally, it's already part and parcel of academic training. The robot is just laparoscopic work, just enhanced with a robotic machine. Mm -hmm. Where available, it is going to become part and parcel of training. If you go in the developed world, there are centers where they almost never do open. All the trainees are trained from laparoscopic and robotic A to Z. The limiting factor with us is availability of resources, even at teaching hospitals, and availability for, uh, uh, to be used for, 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 for training and to operate the general public. But Kruteski has got it, and then uh, uh, also Stellan Bosch has got it. So I'm not sure if the good doctor from Kruteski can hear me and would be willing to share any info, even if it's at a later stage. That, that would be much appreciated. Oh, that's fine. I think if they if they are here, uh, they could just unmute uh, themselves and just uh, share and some. And really feel free to, uh, to 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 help with this topic. It's too big for one man. Or yeah. one person. <laughs> no, thanks. Please do so, colleagues. If you are here from your city or uh, Student Bosch, uh, we want to hear your views on on this matter raised by Doctor uh, who's one of our regulars and quite an uh, engaging uh, 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 clinician. And he, he asked the next question, what has been a, 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 the acceptance level of this modality, especially in low-income communities, as literacy level may be low or still believing in traditional surgery? But, but I don't think it's just a literacy, but I think it's about the state, you know, you know, in, inherent uh, views about certain modalities. Yes. Uh, generally, Patients are very quickly able to discern when you're talking to them, regardless of their literacy level, if you are pushing them in a certain direction or not. And many of them will ask different options. Of course, once you start mentioning erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, most men just say, oh, oh, oh wait a minute, doc, can we uh, maybe at a later stage uh, think about that? And I've had cases where Patients have deferred their own surgery or literally absconded from treatment, regardless that you would have given them all the options that uh, you may get brachytherapy, you may get open surgery, you may get even active surveillance where we would love to see you regularly. They will disappear, resurface later with very advanced diseases. I will be, uh, there's a gentleman, just as an example, that I'll be doing an open surgery in about two weeks' time who disappeared from my care in 2016, and I had thought he'd gone somewhere else for care. And mm -hmm. now he comes back with what was very operable disease then, at a very advanced level, renal failure, urinary blockage, uh, PSA, which was 16, now it's 70. Uh, the metastatic workup and everything is now is still normal, which is good news, MRI, PSMA, PET scans, and all those. Unfortunately, the prostate is much big, so it's going to be a lot more difficult surgery because you also need something to help him relieve his obstructive symptoms. So those still are for real. But in an event where you are able to take your patients uh, in a simple colloquial language that they can understand the implications, I have found that the acceptance is generally very well. The limiting factors is where there is co-payment. We, we, we all know the economics of the country as we speak. And if you tell anybody else that we might need you to pay an extra 12,000 rand, up to 30,000 rand for these procedures, people are not able to afford that. But they will still then be open to something like a brachytherapy if it's a good option for them, uh, open a radical prostatectomy if it's a good option for them. And 
as soon as they have those options being discussed and they can check stuff for themselves. I find the acceptable is the, the, the acceptance level is it, 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 quite comforting. People do take up on treatment. Yeah, no, no thanks for that. Next question back to Dr. Ridaba. She asks, how do you choose between doing a proscopic surgery and robotic surgery, especially in hospital like urology hospital? with availability of robots, uh, is there criteria used to choose between the two modalities? First and foremost, the best is to make sure that whatever is being discussed with the patient, it makes sense to the patient. You are able, or at least you've got access, like in the hospital here, even if I personally maybe have a limitation in something, there's usually a colleague around who can do that. So medicine is not an island. The, 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 the perception of trying to do it all myself uh, really should be forgotten very fast in medicine. We are a team, we depend on each other for excellence and we learn from each other. Uh, let's say the medical aid says that uh, you must pay a co-payment for your robot, but uh, you will know you'll have no co-payment in laparoscopy. Obviously, we will take you for laparoscopy and if I feel like it's going to be a little bit challenging, I will then invite some colleagues who have been doing this work for more than 20 years to come and assist. And you will have a very experienced assistant who is maybe even your teacher, but is also your assistant. And, and we work together. And working together as specialists always assist. Even when we do open surgery, most of the time I will be doing it with another qualified urologist. And, and, and together we put our hands together. So the decision is largely based on the disease factors, uh, the fitness of the patient, and eventually the affordability to the patients, because the skills luckily are usually available where I work. That's not necessarily true for everyone else working somewhere else, but I, I, I happen to be in an institution where there's about 18 neurologists, very experienced laparoscopic surgeons, very experienced robotic surgeons, uh, colleagues who we can work together even to do open surgeries and, uh, and do very, very well. So the decision is not that difficult to make here. And unfortunately, if I am to move here and find myself sitting in another area, it automatically becomes, who's my assistant? What can I do with whoever? If I'm going to be doing laparoscopic, normal laparoscopic surgery, and my assistant is not that experienced, it becomes even more difficult to perform. And it's safer for the patient in that instances, if you find yourself in the middle of, uh, a, 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 let, let's say I'm in Mafike at your clinic's hospital in Victoria Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to come and wait and, 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 and I don't have another urologist around. Uh, luckily, Dr. Mangala is there. He went there. And by the way, he mentored me when I was much a younger doctor uh, working in Mafike. If I'm there and the two of us now are sitting there and we say, hey, Doc, what can we offer the patient? Uh, we will try laparoscopy if it does not work that well because we're struggling with one, two, or three. We will do the operation very competently open and it is safer for the patient. If I'm here at the urology hospital, even if it's a high risk laparoscopic work, there is help. I will just uh, commission one of the very senior colleagues in laparoscopy and we'll be able to do it. So those are the factors that always come into play where we have to take decisions what need to be done. Just for interest, at, at the urology hospital, do you have a, a doctors who are pure, pure robotic surgeons and the others who are just open the proscope pool? They will never even touch the robot. Do you have those? Uh, yes, uh, I, I would say open surgery is for all urologists. The, in South Africa, most, if not all of us, by the time we finish with our fellowship training, we can do open or have yeah. done some open. We may have not done a, 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 a laparoscopy and we may have not, and we will have not done robotics. That will probably change with UCT and Stellar Bosch. Uh, so everyone will be able to do open or they will bring their case to somebody who can do open very competently and work with them. So we continue to learn, hence continual uh, professional development. Over the years, there are guys who have moved away from doing open surgery completely. And for more than a decade, they have never done open because they become so competent with laparoscopic surgery that they can remove almost everything laparoscopically. And whereby if they struggle, there's another colleague they call and together, putting heads together, they are able to succeed. Mm -hmm. When it comes to robotics, 
is still a few guys, maybe six to eight who do robotics uh, and maybe about uh, six to seven who do laparoscopy and the other guys still do open and they can do it retrotypic uh, or they can do it perennially. And usually they are clusters. So Dr. Ijani will be working with that cluster of Dr. YZW uh, and amongst ourselves, we have all complementary skills of robotic laparoscopy open and we revert back to the decisions where I told you how we eventually decide what could be done, what's best for the patient. The working relationship, even though it is a private hospital where everyone still runs their private hospital, has been so collegial that uh, I've never heard of an incident where a colleague needed help and there was nobody to help. So it, it really doesn't happen. And that is one big advantage of having a specialized center with colleagues there. Because even intraoperatively, when you just say who's around the hospital, they check around, they get somebody. Let's say you've got a massive bleed and you are really struggling. You just, people will ask you, should we call somebody? Our scrub technicians, our scrub sisters are also experienced enough to kind of like suggest, Dr. Jani, so and so it's around. Do you think we should just ask them to have a look? And the humility of knowing that you work in a team is such that I've not found egos where people will throw tantrums when they really needed help. It's usually largely accepted. So uh, that's one very big advantage of working here. That's great. It's here. And Dr. Andy Mukari wants to know, is there a place for elective uh, prophylactic prostatectomy? Uh, if so, at what age is it? No, not at the moment. There has been instances, oh, okay, that takes us to very interesting stuff now that uh, prostate surgery, uh, prostate cancer, it's also a very genetic disease. So there are instances where there is familial preponderance, uh, where there are multiple family members, where there is very strong breast cancer. We know that uh, uh, breast cancer gene two, uh, I think which is on chromosome 13, has been coded to be associated with more aggressive prostate cancers. Uh, but if you look at the morbidity of performing prostate surgery, the whole world, because they're always a little bit ahead of us in as far as screening programs and everything, have now started to review, are we over treating prostate cancer? Where things like active surveillance it has become a very important uh, tool for managing prostate cancer. Uh, if you are younger, you have a low risk disease, uh, you are an informed uh, person who can easily follow, we are able to still follow you over years, three to four years without doing operations and only operate to at a later stage, still with very excellent outcome. Uh, and, and I have seen professionals, informed patients who then will take that options. At some point, people will panic and say, doc, can we just get this done and over so that I can sleep well? But if you look at uh, where we are, the risk of erectile dysfunctions, the risk of incontinence, which we now know uh, are now being minimized, it will probably move more to where we have much more safer uh, surgeries and to, to, to can move to a point where somebody can be told that maybe we should do prophylactic prostatectomy, but that will mean we'll have to define our genetics better, where I can, with confidence and evidence, tell you that if you are a carrier of one, two, three, the odds are that you will have one, two, three. And unfortunately, from the genetic side, we are not there yet. So the fact that you are a carrier of a gene does not therefore correlate into you like in breast cancer, where the odds are so high that we do prophylactic mastectomy. With prostate, we are not there yet. The evidence is still sluggish. If and when it comes, probably in the next uh, generation, that might become uh, an important topic of discussions. Uh, it's not yet uh, available. No, thank you, but that was a good question, Doctor. We, we, and one of the reasons is because uh, with the a localized, well-worked up prostate cancer, uh, we will still be able to cure you very competently between 80 to 95%. And even if you have the disease, uh, 
life expectancy can still be 15 years plus, even with a very aggressive disease, uh, if you are being managed. So if you uh, have to weigh all those options, you realize that probably there are other better ways to still manage us. If you get screened, if you get checked, that's more than suffice than to just get your prostate out. Yeah, no, that's good news to hear, yeah. Sure. Um, Dr. Malau, uh, this is, I'm sure this is the last question that we have here. It's been a, quite an engaging, exciting uh, topic and, and also thanks for the engagement. Uh, he wants to know, in, in cases where the possibilities of robotic surgery becomes autonomous, are we heading to the situation where companies that can buy these machines might start doing this uh, uh, themselves uh, without the involvement of the specialist at, at all? <laughs> It will go back to, before they can even do that, uh, they'll have to find ways of making a diagnosis. And yeah. so if we look at the diagnosis of prostate cancer right now, we know MRI is very sensitive in picking suspicious high risk, functional MRIs, functional ultrasounds, and et cetera, et cetera, have achieved uh, very good sensitivity and specificity in guiding us in taking biopsies. But we have not reached a level where we can just screen you with an MRI, make a diagnosis, subject you to surgery without doing a biopsy. So it will take a, a long time with a lot of other evolving technologies where the diagnosis could be made without an involvement of specialists. Biopsies could be done without the involvement of specialists. PSA could be done. So I don't see that happening. I think it will always remain an interactions between companies, humans, and et cetera, because at some point, even that machine, people still have to program the machine, service it, make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. And the question of who remain responsible for any outcome. I don't know if the CEO of some company out there will want to remain responsible for explaining urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, possible rectal injury, bowel injury, and all that. So I think the human factor will remain part of that. Uh, I think I did see another flashing question where somebody was asking about prognostic factors in prostate cancers. Uh, largely, uh, if in African men, we know that the disease uh, become more aggressive in a younger age, uh, but as we grow older, the incident is not as high as in other uh, groups like uh, the Caucasians and the Asians. Uh, we know that uh, uh, if you have a very strong uh, family history of prostate cancer and breast cancers, and if you, uh, you have other components of metabolic syndrome, hypertension, increased uh, uh, central obesity, uh, those can increase your risks. Uh, there are no prophylaxis that is well prescribed now for minimizing the risk of prostate cancers. There are things that have been looked at, but there is no universal agreement on chemo prevention, on food stuff. There's a lot said about different stuff in the internet. Most of it when subjected to proper testing with the randomized control, uh, blinded studies, it has not passed the masters. So a lot of what is being said keep evolving. There was a time when we told you, please, please uh, avoid the red meat. We know now the evidence is very weak. We do encourage taking leukopenes, which is like tomato uh, uh, sauce cooked and compressed uh, to a certain degree, they can assist with that. And unfortunately, <laughs> uh, what is also being reported is that if you have uh, about 21 ejaculations a month. Uh, you can do the math how many ejaculations you must have a week. That can also be indicated to be a little bit protective, but I don't think what else we are going to be doing if we're ejaculating that often. So uh, uh, there's not much around prevention. And if we pick the disease early, that's all that is really important. Yeah. We need to make an early diagnosis. And uh, that's really key. Uh, the other prognosis factors are too detailed and too specific. I would rather you discuss them with your own doctor. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, at the beginning, we, we, when we had a chat, we spoke about your, your training that you, after qualifying at UCT, then you went to do a fellowship at University of Pretoria and also to, uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. 
and uh, Dr. Kinoche is, you know, you, you mentioned him, that he's, he's, well, he was a CEO at STMP at the time and convinced yeah. to stay and, and become the head of unit of geology there. So it's a proud moment for him also as he sits he, and listening to you. He, he's, <laughs> I'm sure where he is, he's still feeling a loss that I did leave Steve Biko, but uh, <laughs> there were other forces and uh, I wouldn't have become the robotic surgeon if I stayed with Steve Biko. So, uh, the, the now current chair has uh, been pushing and trying to recruit me back. I am slowly and surely um, starting to incline to come in to assist where I can. Uh, but yes, uh, Dr. Enes Kinoshi was there during my LES and uh, uh, my development, and I can see them. Hi, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, uh, Janine, thanks for thanks for a, a wonderful and inspiring uh, uh, talk today and I think you've given us a, a hope and I think you are giving a lot of men out there a hope with uh, prosthetic issues so thank you very much for uh, coming uh, to present this especially with clinic cell group with which I'm with which with I'm working thanks Kat. okay thanks a lot yeah and I'm sure you it work with the colleagues as team people to to bring you back and to do training because when we uh, do training, uh, further training for, for doctors there. You, you're one of those people who need to train uh, up and coming doctors on robotics and urologists. There are quite some yeah. many compliments, but I'm going to leave that to uh, Dr. John Bohopa, who's our uh, group occupational health manager, to do the closing remarks and uh, word of things. Hi, Doc. Um, good evening, colleagues. Uh, Good evening, Dr. Bila. Um, Dr. Ijani, a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation indeed, Doc. We, we really thank you. Um, we'd like thank to send, uh, obviously, gratitude, you know, from the Clinics Health Group for such, you know, brilliant, uh, you know, and groundbreaking stuff, you know, if one may, may say, groundbreaking indeed. And uh, one clearly sees, you know, the passion that comes, you know, through as you as you presenting. I mean, uh, you know, through your voice, we can we can really have a lot of confidence. You know, uh, going forward in this era of uh, of robotic surgery, and uh, and yeah, we thank you. Um, so yeah, on behalf of you know Clinics Health Group, you know the group CEO of um, of Clinics, Dr. Mateke, and the Exco and the board members, we'd like to thank you uh, very much, and we we wish you know for further discussions and perhaps even more you know uh, presentations at. Uh, at a, at a later stage, you know, of the year and then some time to come. And um, yeah, I would also, you know, like to take this opportunity to thank our marketing team, you know, you know, with uh, Dr. Bila at the helm, you know, of our, of our clinical team as well for holding, uh, you know, the fort for this, you know, weekly, you know, webinars, which obviously um, um, carry CPD accreditation for all the practitioners uh, that tune in. And we, we humbly, humbly ask, you know, that uh, they tune in again once more uh, next week. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bila. And uh, Dr. Ijani, we thank you very much, my brother. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you guys. Uh, and I am uh, available uh, for, for, for future talks in whichever way you feel I could be of assistance to the group. It also assists me with re-evaluating that which I think I know and finding ways to be able to present it to you, make me think about it and think, uh, wonder if I really do uh, understand what I'm trying to say. So moments like this are not only beneficial to you, but to us also as professionals, we have to go back to our literature, review it and make sure that when you quote me, I can stand proud and say, please do quote me on that. And thank you very much once again for wonderful attendance and, and nice, inspiring questions. No, thanks a lot, for, uh, Dr. Jenny. And I just thought uh, Professor Mashu Chifula will just uh, was, has, has joined us and we'll be having him uh, on the 4th of August. And thank you very much, colleagues. And thanks, uh, Dr. Jenny. Wonderful time. Thank you. And have thank a, you very good, much, guys. And have bye -bye. a good evening. Sure. Okay, bye. Oh.